You'll have worked out that over these last few months, these final few months, as I approach the end of, of ministry, I'm trying to preach on all the things that I've not preached about in the last 36 years. And there are just a few passages which I think I really should have preached on but, but haven't done. Uh, and tonight we come to one of the parables, uh, which curiously enough, I've never, never spoken on. Uh, so we're in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Jesus tells the parable and then he uh, explains its meaning to his disciples privately later. So we're starting at Matthew 13 verse 24 and then we're going to jump uh, to verse 36 for the explanation. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field but while everything was sleeping his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat sprouted and formed ears, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed into your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at that time I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Verse 36, he left the crowd and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And Jesus answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, the good wheat seed stands for the people of the kingdom, the weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Jesus told 39 parables recorded in the four gospels. and Counting it up, I have preached on 35 of them in my time here at North Springfield. All those sermons are on the blog. Uh, leaves me four left to do. Uh, so for uh, number 36 uh, tonight, we're going to look at the parable of the wheat and the weeds, uh, which is so significant that Jesus not only told the story, but then also explained what it meant. Weeds are a very familiar problem to anybody who ever tries to grow anything in a garden. Sometimes it seems as if the weeds take over uh, and it gets to the point where you stop bothering to pull up the weeds uh, to let the flowers thrive. You just pull up the flowers to let the weeds thrive. I'm told that's what the Japanese have been doing for years. So if anybody ever looks at my garden, I just tell them that I'm practicing Japanese gardening. Um, if weeds are an inconvenience to gardeners, they are disastrous for farmers. Uh, weeds like Darnell have uh, poisonous properties. Uh, if they get into a field of wheat, then the whole crop can be ruined. And that was such a problem that there was specifically a Roman law against sowing Darnell in a field of wheat as an act of revenge against an enemy. I think that's the background to Jesus' parable here of weeds among the wheat. Jesus told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat sprouted and formed ears, then the weeds also appeared. This is a parable like many others about how God's kingdom grows. This is what it's like when God is acting as king we sometimes expect life to unfold in ways that we can anticipate and sometimes 
uh, our expectations are disappointed, and that was the case here. Uh, Jesus' disciples were expecting the kingdom of God to come in particular ways. Uh, that wasn't happening. The parable explains how God's purposes sometimes work out the way we expect, sometimes they don't. It's a parable about delay. Um, when the wheat sprouted up and formed ears, the weeds also appeared. And the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he said. Jesus had come announcing the kingdom of God is at hand. So why hadn't God's kingdom fully come yet? Why hadn't heaven arrived on earth in Jesus' ministry? Why the delay? Um, why are there still weeds amongst the wheat? Why is there evil in the world? Why haven't all the evildoers been removed and punished? Why is there still sin in the church? Both these questions have remained over the centuries, not only as evil triumphed in the world, uh, but the church has also been blighted by heresy, by immorality, by corruption. Uh, through history, even still today, G.K. Chesterton a century ago observed that at least six times in history, the church has gone to the dogs. But he said, in each case, it has been the dog that has died. But why the delay? Why are there still weeds among the wheat? Why after 2000 years hasn't the kingdom of God come on earth yet? Um, some people think it's because God is powerless to do anything, to change human history. Other people think it's because God doesn't care what happens to human beings. But the parable of the weeds among the, weeds among the wheat uh, explains the true reason for the persistence of evil and suffering in the world. Servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull the weeds up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them, let both grow together until the harvest. The delay is waiting for the harvest. That's just good farming practice. Uh, good old lallium temulentum, uh, darnel, uh, a, a species of rye grain that harbors a, a rather poisonous fungus. Uh, but the problem is when it's just sprouting up. It's impossible to tell Darnell from wheat. Um, the only sensible thing to do is to leave it to grow side by side with the wheat until harvest time comes. And then you can tell the different plants apart. Then you can pick up the wheat and the weeds separately. So when it comes to evil in the world, when it comes to sin in the church, God is still in control. God, of course, cares about all the problems, about the suffering. Um, but the parable tells us that all is not going to be sorted out in this life until the day of harvest, the day of judgment. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters to collect the weeds first, tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. One day God is going to put right all the wrongs in the world. He will separate good from evil, but not yet. The parable points forward to the day when there will be, after the delay, a time of division. In the poetry of the parable, the weeds will be separated from the wheat on the day of harvest. Weeds will be burned and the wheat taken safely into the barns. And in the same way, Jesus explains on the day of judgment, God will separate the righteous from the unrighteous. Stephen Travis uses the phrase, the great divide. C.S. Lewis called it the great divorce. Uh, Jesus gives... Uh, a literal explanation of what the poetry of the parable means. And he says, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
The Bible tells us that Jesus will be the agent of judgment for the whole of humanity. And there'll be a separation in two ways. They'll be separating out all that causes sin, and they'll be separating out all who do evil. And these, Jesus explains, are consigned to the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Can I point out that those phrases, the burning furnace, the, the weeping and the gnashing of teeth, are in Jesus' explanation of the parable and not in the parable itself. The parable is poetry, it's symbolic, but Jesus' explanation is in plain language. Uh, and we do the, the parable a disservice if we think that the place of burning and the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth are only symbolic. Well, in a sense, they, of course, are, are symbolic. Um, I did hear about a lady who introduced a similar sermon at this point and said, uh, what about those people who've lost all their teeth? <laughs> and the minister wisely replied, I am sure that in the afterlife, a teeth for gnashing will be provided. <laughs> I'm not wanting to minimize the seriousness of what Jesus is saying here. Everything that causes sin, all who do evil, will be thrown into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, some people like to deny the existence of hell, uh, but those two, um, those places where Jesus talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth, there are six places where this is mentioned. Um, they are a serious warning about judgment. Uh, and Jesus says, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If we think, if we believe that there is truly going to be a heaven uh, where the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the father, then there is a dark side to that hope. Uh, the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, all the Old Testament uh, foretold this. All the Jews in Jesus' time were expecting this great divide between good and evil on the day of judgment. All the teachings of Jesus, uh, especially his death on the cross, only makes sense if this day of division will be a reality. They only make sense if human beings are truly lost without the salvation which Jesus came to bring. There will be a day of judgment. We get exactly the same message in another parable of Jesus, uh, which we read in Matthew 13. So I'm doing two for the price of one this evening, ticking numbers 37 off my list of parables. Um, the parable of the net, where Jesus said in Matthew 13, uh, from verse 47, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. And when it was full, the fish fishermen pulled it up to the shore. They sat down and collected the good fish in buckets, but threw the bad away. And this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The net represents the kingdom of God. The fish represent human beings. Fishermen represent God, Jesus. Um, those elements are poetic. But then the explanation that Jesus gives following the parable, the explanation is surely in some senses literal. God will separate the wicked from the righteous. And again, in this parable, the people who are not saved will be thrown into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Actually, at least 15 of Jesus' parables were warnings about the day of judgment. Uh, we know from the rich fool and the wise and foolish builders, um, 
we remember uh, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus or um, the parable of the wicked tenants in the vineyard. Fifteen of them about being ready for the day of judgment. But even if Jesus hadn't told all those other parables, even if Jesus hadn't talked explicitly about the day of the Lord that was coming, um, the two parables of the, the weeds amongst the wheat and the parable of the net point to a day of judgment that is coming. It is certain. And there's nowhere in any of Jesus' parables which give any expectation that it'll be all right for everybody in the end, that everybody's going to be saved. Uh, all of Jesus' parables about judgment speak of the reality of a judgment which is inescapable. And that's no surprise, of course, because the whole of the Old Testament was looking forward to that. The whole of the New Testament bears the same witness. In a few weeks, we're going to look at the second letter of Peter. Uh, and uh, Peter makes that point, that judgment day is coming. Uh, Paul taught the same in many places. One, two Thessalonians uh, chapter 1 uh, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in bl blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among those who have believed. A day of separation. The day of great division. It's coming. The book of Revelation is very clear in, in the prophecies about the new Jerusalem. In Revelation 21, I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And it goes on. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this. I will be their God. They will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. The book of Revelation is very clear that judgment day is coming. Division is inevitable and everything that's Evil will be permanently excluded from the presence of the holy and righteous God. Billy Graham explained it like this. Um, hell was not prepared for man. God never meant that man would ever go to hell. Hell was, not, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. But man rebelled against God and followed the devil. Hell is essentially and basically banishment from the presence of God. That division is inescapable. We dare not ignore or soft pedal all of Jesus' warnings about hell and about judgment. The day of judgment is coming. There's an interesting story about uh, the actor W.C. Fields, uh, who was on his deathbed in hospital. A friend visited him and was very surprised to find Fields reading the Bible. Um, the friend asked, what, what was he doing reading the Bible? And W.C. Fields allegedly replied, I'm looking for loopholes. But very sadly for many, there are no loopholes in the Bible. The day of judgment is coming. There may be a delay in these times as the farmer waits until the harvest to separate the weeds from the wheat. But the day of judgment is coming. And so the parable about delay, about division, also calls for decision. Because harvest day is coming, everything that causes sin and all who do evil will be separated as the darnel is weeded out, weeded out from the wheat at harvest time. The righteous will shine into the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Jesus' parables don't just inform us, they call us to make decisions. They demand a response. 
the secret of any parable is to understand the punchline and what response is Jesus calling people to make? He explains why the, the farmer is delayed separating the weeds from the wheat. Uh, because you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them, let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The, the purpose of the delay, the reason that the farmer waits until the harvest time is so that none of the genuine wheat is lost. It's allowing as many as possible to be saved. We'll see this again in the second letter of Peter in a few weeks' time. The delay is giving the opportunity for a miracle, something totally unnatural for weeds to, to turn into wheat. But the question is very simple for everyone on the day of judgment. Will we turn out to be true wheat or will we turn out just to have been the imposter weeds? The field is the world. The good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. The enemy who sows them is the devil. At the end of the age, will we prove to be the people of the kingdom or will we prove to be the people of the evil one? Wheat or weeds. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Uh, Jesus ends with this little joke. Um, the way that the farmer can tell the wheat from the weeds once they're fully grown is that when they're fully grown, wheat has ears and Darnell does not. Uh, whenever God's word is proclaimed, people are deciding from themselves whether they will be saved, uh, whether they will be lost. Those who hear the message and respond to it will be saved. Those who reject all the opportunities to receive God's love will remain lost. There is the possibility that weeds can turn into wheat, can grow ears. But for now, there is delay. God is holding off judgment day so that as many as possible will be saved. But on that day of ultimate division, it will depend what decision we've made. Weeds or wheat, the people of the evil one or the people of the kingdom. Whoever has ears, let him hear.